Okay, uh, I'm Steve Martin. I'm the Dean of Biological Sciences here. Uh, and I'd like to say that Berkeley and I, are, uh, we're both delighted to uh, host today's event, which is the second uh, Bay Area-wide conference on viruses. Uh, so I'm myself a virologist, or I, sh I guess I should say more accurately, a recovering ex-virologist. Um, I started out in life working on retroviruses, or as they were then called, RNA tumor viruses. I still prefer that term. Anyway, it's also particularly appropriate that this meeting is being held in Stanley Hall, the, the new Stanley Hall, which is on the site of the original Stanley Hall, which was named after Wendell Stanley, who I think uh, probably all of you know uh, was the first person to physically isolate and crystallize a virus, tobacco mosaic virus, the work that won him the Nobel Prize many, many half a century ago or more. Uh, so the old Stanley Hall uh, was the site of the Berkeley Virus Lab. It housed many eminent virologists, including Heinz Frankel Conrad, who was the first person to demonstrate uh, that TMV RNA was infectious, the first demonstration of an infectious nucleic acid. Um, Harry Rubin, uh, the developer of the focus assay, uh, co-developer, I should say, with Howard Temin, uh, many other eminent virologists. So um, this is really a very uh, appropriate locale for this, this symposium. So I don't need to tell you that um, work on viruses remains uh, an intensely exciting field, both from the point of view of looking at basic mechanisms of cell biology and molecular virology and molecular biology, uh, and also because um, uh, viruses have a, such an impact on our health, uh, the environment, uh, food production, uh, energy, uh, and many other facets of our lives. Um, you only have to look at your newspaper, or I guess I should say uh, your iPad, or whatever you get your news from, uh, the Comedy, Comedy Central, um, uh, to realize, to, you know, to, to see the, every day the latest news on viruses, whether it's um, engineering uh, infectious variants of, uh, of avian flu, or the latest discovery up at LBNL, uh, an engineered M13 that can uh, generate uh, <coughs> electricity from mechanical energy, uh, the latest discoveries on HIV and AIDS, um, all of these remain, uh, are of course, exciting developments. And so a lot of these exciting developments are actually taking place right here in the Bay Area. Um, and so what our goal is with this meeting is to try and connect all of you, all of the uh, virology researchers in the Bay Area with each other. So, you know, we, we all live uh, within a few hours of each other, maybe down on the peninsula, across the bay in San Francisco, or here in the East Bay. Um, we're in a, a, a rich um, ecosystem, as it were, of, of uh, pharma companies, biotech companies, universities, research institutes, national labs. Um, but we really see very little of each other um, from day to day. We often see each other more at national meetings than we do uh, here in the Bay Area. And that's something we'd really like to do something about. Um, so what we hope this meeting will accomplish is firstly to introduce you to some of the latest developments in the field. Uh, we hope that you're going to learn about local facilities or institutes or centers that can help you in your research. We hope you're going to meet uh, people that you might want to collaborate with uh, or if you're in the job market, people who might give you high-paying uh, jobs. <laughs> so um, all of these are uh, the goals of the meeting, and I hope we'll accomplish all of them. Uh, we're also going to be launching the Bay Area Viruses Network, and you're going to uh, hear more about this from Laurent Koskoy. Uh, he's putting a, uh, together a web portal uh, that's going to make some of these resources uh, available to you. And we're hoping that this, uh, this portal, together with the, some, today's symposium, uh, is going to help uh, build new links within 
this, uh, this ecosystem of, of virus researchers. So um, I'd like to thank the sponsors of the meeting, and that includes uh, the Wheeler Center for Emerging and ne Neglected Diseases, uh, SEND, here at UC Berkeley, uh, the Center for AIDS Research at UCSF, uh, then several companies, Gilead, Alios Biopharma, and 3V Biosciences. Uh, and then I also want to thank the organizing committee, uh, uh, particularly including um, Melanie Ott from the Gladstone, uh, Paul Lucy at, at uh, UC Davis, uh, and Peter Sarnow at Stanford. And so finally, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come here and participate in this meeting. We hope it's going to be very useful and very enjoyable and, and, and an exciting meeting. And we're really delighted to have you all uh, here on the Berkeley campus. And uh, we want you to have a good day and we lo look forward to many more such interactions in the future. Okay, thank you. And Okay. Um Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, in the name of uh, Laurent, Paul, and Peter, uh, my name is Melanie Ott. Um, I also wanted to welcome you here for the second uh, Bay Area Virology Symposium. It's really exciting to be back here. And um, I'm going to chair this session, and without further ado, I will um, introduce Carla Kierkegaard, our first speaker from Stanford, who is going to talk about suppressing diversity in RNA viruses. Great to be here. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me, and it's nice to see all these people I know and that I want to know also. Okay, this is a very, um, I was an undergrad at Berkeley, and so, you know, I would, I, it's okay if I use politically incorrect titles. Um, as you know, you know <laughs> people, um, people often, you know, expound about the diversity of RNA viruses, and that's, of course, a fact of life, and that's Suppressing it is, of course, something that we aim to do in, antivi in antiviral development. It is also something that gets done. You know, sometimes people talk about viral diversity as though, you know, anything can happen, right? You know, there's just endless um, mutational space. But that's not entirely true. First of all, there is an endless mutational space. And second of all, there are cell biology mechanisms that I think I'll show you can suppress some aspects of diversity. And one thing we want to do is take adva advantage of those mechanisms, both by vi the viruses interacting themselves and by their dependence on host factors that might help us a little bit um, in antiviral design. We're going to talk about drug resistance, but I want you to remember that drug resistance is just sort of evolution on speed. So we're interested in viral evolution in the context of this you know, applied context of, of antiviral design. So as you guys know, given the diversity of RNA viruses, this is supposed to represent viral genomes. One infects this cell. Pretty soon, there is a lot of RNA synthesis. I'm going to talk about poliovirus, a positive strand RNA virus, virus, but this is supposed to be representative of all um, highly mutable viruses. OK, so one starts this infection, and then pretty soon, there are hundreds. These should be all different colors, but I didn't have the patience to do that. <laughs> Imagine them all different colors because the error rate is high enough that there's at least one mutation per genome. Um, this one's going to be special, right? It hasn't hit a selective pressure yet, but let's say the drug's going to happen. The diversity pre-exists. The drug-resistant virus, so conventional wisdom goes, will amplify and take over, you know, us, right? So that's, you know, the way that it's mathematically modeled. But, you know, viruses don't live in mathematical space. They live in cells. So if you think about the rapid outgrowth of this particular one in the presence of all these others, you, you realize that that makes an assumption. The assumption is that this benefit that this more fit virus has is virus autonomous. That is, it's not helping any of its neighbors, and none of its neighbors are hurting it. Our goal is to identify drug targets such that the neighbors, the unfit neighbors, will inhibit the growth of the more fit genome. I'll get to that in a second. You guys know um, that the paradigms for drug resistance and how to fight them in RNA virology um, are multiple drug therapy, which has been used so beautifully in HIV. It's also good for the drug companies, of course. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, it does work in many cases, and that's, that's a, a very effective paradigm. Now, for positive strain viruses like polio, we're lucky if we have one 
antiviral. There are none for you know, dengue. There are none for yellow fever. There are none for um, SARS, right? So multiple drug, drug therapy at this point is a little bit of a joke. Um, you choose a target for which drug-resistant mutations have a high fitness cost. You hear that sometimes. You know, they'll be like the active site of a protease or something. You think, oh, well, a mutation there that's going to confer drug resistance is going to be unfit. That might be true, but, you know, these highly mutable viruses have a way of getting around that, too, of course. I'm going to talk about this idea of choosing dominant drug targets, um, which I alluded to and I'll explain better, and targeting a host protein or RNA or process. Okay, so what I mean by that, imagine that you have a, uh, you're this special virus, right? <laughs> you have a talent that, that um, you know, none of these other ones have. Can, you can imagine, I'm sure, being born into a family horrible enough that no one will ever recognize your talent, right? So, so for example, if you're, a, if you're an RNA genome that makes a viral capsid that is resistant to the drug that's going to hit, too bad, because your subunits are going to assemble with, you know, 59 other subunits, and that's going to render, a, you know, this, this chimeric virus drug sensitive, even if you are making good, yeah, even if you're making drug-resistant capsids. Is that true? And you can see that this idea of the dominance of drug susceptible genomes would work for almost any oligomeric target or anything that processes an oligomeric target in some cases. Okay, so here are the drugs and compounds that have been used against, um, well, that work in, in, in tissue culture against poliovirus, and some of them have been tested in animals. Um, they have three different drug targets. One is um, rupintravir. Now, Amy Patek is here. Yeah who um, knows the beautiful um, profile in tissue culture of rupintravir. So this is the, the protease uh, encoded, the so-called um, major protease enc encoded by poliovirus. There's the active site. Rupintravir targets the active site. You can see this is a drug. Um, this is the absence of drug. Here's a drug-sensitive virus. Here's drug-resistant virus. Presence of drug, you can see that. Very impressive inhibition. And the drug-resistant virus is, of course, drug-resistant. Here's another compound that's been used for a long time, guanidine. We use it to denature proteins, of course, but at very low concentrations and inhibit this, this um, membrane-associated protein called 2C. You can see that it inhibits the wild-type virus. You can get drug-resistant virus. Here's a compound called V073. It's currently in clinical trials to be used in the poliovirus eradication campaign. And you might ask yourself, why is that? Because look, there's only a like, two or th three log inhibition, and you also get drug-resistant virus. So what I'm going to tell you is that if you worked for some company, right, you'd say, I'm going to go with this one, right, because it, it you know, the low frequency of drug resistance and it has this nice active site targeting. I'm going to tell you that if you're a gen geneticist, you can think through this and realize why it's this one that's made it into clinical trials and might help us with the eradication campaign. Okay, so specifically, you can see that there are 60 binding sites. Well, this is a beautiful icosahedral capsid of poliovirus. These compounds bind around the five-fold axis. So there are 60 binding sites per variant. Is it true? That, I mean, if this isn't a transacting oligomer, I don't know what is. So it, this should be our test case for whether this idea of suppressing drug resistance um, works. And this work was done by Elizabeth Tanner, who's in the audience and giving a poster. So sorry, I think I'm giving away like everything in your poster. <laughs> Um, okay, so what happens? So are drug-sensitive viruses um, dominant over drug-resistant ones? The answer is yes. I hope you can read this. This is 10 viruses per cell of the drug-resistant. You can see it grows fine in the presence of drug, but as you titrate in drug-sensitive virus, there's a profound inhibition of the growth in tissue culture. Not the case with guanidine, which, is, which had that 2C target, which is membrane-associated. Not the case, I'm sorry, Amy, with rupintravir which um, is also, if anything, helped by the presence of drug-sensitive virus. So in the case of the oligomeric target, but not these other ones, um, drug-sensitive viruses in the same cell can be um, dominant inhibitors. What about in mice? So what I told you was two cycles of, one cycle of infection in tissue culture. What about in mice? So we're going to look at viruses after four days or more after which they've been able to undergo multiple cycles of infection. So here are mice dying of wild-type poliovirus. Here they are, still dying in the presence of guanidine, administered, I will say, three times daily um, for the duration of this experiment. 
They're, um, it's administered intramuscularly, so you can see we can harvest the virus from the muscle and look at the titer. You can see that in the guanine treatment, there's really no reduction in the titer. So, you know, in the literature, people have done these experiments for 20, 30 years, and it's concluded in the literature that guanidine is not stable in the mouse. But it must be doing something, look, because of the selection for drug resistance. That's the incidence of drug resistance, that's the frequency. So you can see that the frequency of drug resistance goes up a lot after four days of growth in the mouse, so it must be doing something. Of course, we can't conclude that this is why it's, it's not effective, but it certainly is not going to help. Okay, here's a low dose of that compound I told you about, the capsid poison that inhibits polyovirus um, and is, being, is in phase two trials. Here it is, um, here are mice dying in the presence of, when they're treated with PBS, here they are not dying as much in the presence of VO73. We used a kind of wimpy dose of this because we wanted there to be a lot of virus there for the reasons I'm going to show you. So here's the amount of virus present when, you know, without the drug, here it is with the drug. And here is the incidence of drug resistance, and here's the frequency. So you can see that, um, as I told you before, the frequency of drug resistance to this compound is higher than this, but there's no selection for it over time. So we think that this kind of supports the point that oligomeric drug targets are, um, can suppress the outgrowth of drug resistance. Um, here, we're out of drugs, so what about the other um, coding regions of this positive strand RNA virus? Um, they have really boring names, and I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> these are the capsid proteins. This is the major protease. This is the minor protease. These are the membrane-associated proteins, and that's the polymerase. So what Scott Crowder, when he was a postdoc in my lab, did was mix wild-type RNA. Now, wild-type RNA is the most fit virus, and mix that with a combination with 10 copies each, this thing. There it is. <laughs> I have my finger over that. Okay, so with 10 copies each of one, each one of these um, defective viruses, they're all dead on their own, and ask the wild-type virus, so who bothers you? And the answer is, namely, which of these is dominant over the wild-type RNA? And this is a really sad slide. Um, pink is dominant. Um, blue is recessive. And you can see, look at that. That's the major protease. We expected that because of the Rupintrovir result. Here's the polymerase, which we love very much, with only two dominant alleles. Everything in the capsid is dominant, um, which is really good news. You know, as we say in lab, you know, to ruin a party, you have to go. <laughs> so what we want, so it turns out that, you know, things like capsids are so interactive that even if they have a point mutation that's lethal, they will um, still dominantly inhibit. This is very interesting. This is the cis-acting protease that makes exactly one cut in the, in the polyprotein. And it acts only intramolecularly. So you say, why is everything in that dominant? It turns out that intramolecular proteases, if they can't cut, will always accumulate a precursor, even in the presence of more fit genomes. If the precursor is toxic, every virus in the cell dies. And that's the case here. So I would submit that these are what, this is what we found for poliovirus. These are dominant drug targets for this RNA virus and probably others that are positive strand. Oligomeric things like viral cores and capsids, this is a mouthful, intramolecularly cleaving proteases that process toxic precursors, and um, two alleles of the polymerase. And we understand a little bit about the biochemistry of that, so I'm not going to go into it here. Um, we're in the process of testing whether these principles apply to other positive strand RNA viruses. We realize that the genetics is kind of obscure, so we're trying to just use drugs, because that's... Um, and there are a lot of compounds now in various stages of development that target both oligomeric and non-oligomeric um, targets for these viruses. So we're really at the stage, and this is Roberto Mateo's and Dave Constant's work, we're really at the stage of selecting drug-resistant alleles. Um, and uh, Nick Van Buren just came to work on this project, so that's great. Okay, so, so I talked about, we know how to inhibit the outgrowth of, of drug-resistant virus in the first cell. What happens then? As you know, you know, if you, if this, oops, if this drug-resistant virus gets out and spreads in a non-dispersive manner, then, um, you know, you're off to the races with drug resistance. But how do viruses spread anyway? I mean, do they spread like doing a plaque assay? They get into your bloodstream and spread dispersively, so every new progeny gets its own cell? Or do they spread locally, you know, leaking to the neighbor cells? That's important both from the cell biology aspect and for the population genetics, right? Because, again, if you're born into this horrible family, you can't express your, your, your good features. Um, 
you know, and you get to go off to college, right? You know, maybe somebody will notice. But, but if you, you know, you go to work at the Dairy Queen with all these horrible cousins and relatives and stuff, you know, it might just continue this, uh, this um, suppression of your talents. And that's what we hope is going to be the case at, le in at least some viral infections and must have happened to some extent in the mouse infection. So how do viruses spread anyway? How does polio virus spread? Is it local? Is it dispersive? And how do we learn about that? Well, it turns out the cell biology of viruses affects a lot about their budding exit and spread. Remember that polio virus is a non-enveloped virus. So it's a cytoplasmic virus. Here's a polio virus infected cell. And you know, uh, officially, the only way a non-enveloped virus, which is essentially a piece of cytoplasm, can get out is through cell lysis. And when we teach about viruses, of course, we all say that, that adenovirus, SV40, poliovirus exit the cell by cell lysis. And I'm not going to say that they don't, but it turns out that in the literature, there are a lot of examples of non-lytic spread. And that literature is compromised by the fact that you can say, well, two cells lysed, and who would know? So I want to talk to you about experiments in my lab that show, I think, that the cell biology um, of this infection allows basically unconventional secretion of viruses and other, other cytoplasmic constituents. So here's what happens during poliovirus infection. Like in all positive strand RNA viruses, membranes get altered and proliferated. And then RNA replication occurs on the outside of these vesicles that accumulate. Those vesicles, interestingly enough, are not regular just single membrane vesicles. They're double membrane vesicles that look a lot like cellular autophagosomes. So autophagosomes, as most of you know, are degradative organelles in the cell that are induced by lots of stresses. They envelop cytoplasm and then go on to target it for degradation. We don't see that degradation in poliovirus infection, but what they have in common with autophagosomes are double membranes, cytoplasmic lumen. I think you can see um, this one, mitochondrion, <laughs> and, um, and there's the, a couple markers of um, autophagy are located there. This one we'll see later, LC3. It gets recruited. It's often used as a marker for autophagy infused with GFP, and you'll see some of that later. OK, so when we found this, our hypothesis became, oh, well, maybe polyovirus-induced vesicles are derived from the autophagy pathway. Let's see what happens when we knock down components of the autophagy pathway by RNAi. So here's when you knock down LC3. That's intracellular virus. Here's ATG12, another component. That's intracellular virus. And you know, there's a threefold to twofold reduction. So at least we know the virus isn't being cleared by those double membrane vesicles. But you know, we were a little bit disappointed by that result until we looked at extracellular virus and we saw a much more profound effect. And then you might say, what extracellular virus? I mean, this is only six hours post infection, and um, cells shouldn't be lysing at that time. Again, you know, maybe just a couple lysed, even at six hours post infection. But our hypothesis at that time became you know, maybe this is the fabled non-lytic exit route of, of, of cytoplasm, right? Maybe these double membrane vesicles, by virtue of forming throughout infection, can sometimes envelop virus. If they were to go on to degrade, you could exocytose virus directly because this degradation mixes lumen and cytosol. If they just blubbed out this little um, exosome-like particle, it probably wouldn't be long for this world, and maybe that would allow the exit of viruses. So our hypothesis became maybe the cellular process of autophagy allows viral spread. Of course, if you do something in cell biology, you have to come up with an acronym. So we did that, but I don't think it's going to catch on. <laughs> OK, so this is the work of Sarah, who's also here, and she has a poster. So you want to see some viruses spread. This is, um, these are expressing GFP LC3. You can see some of them are punctate. They might have been stressed already. You're going to see a virus that expresses DS red at a very low multiplicity of infection spreading through this. And can you guys see this, or do we need the lights off? Yeah? Back says thumbs up. OK, so, so now we're going to watch viruses spread and become, so watch this one. This one's great. <laughs> and you'll see that they become punctate. Um, before you see the red virus. You know, there's a lag before you see the, the RFP made. But you see the local spread of these viruses and the spectacular sort of GFP puncta forming in many of them. This is um, live imaging over 48 hours of virus infection. Again, dead by Sarah and our collaborators, Nate and Marcus. 
Okay, so in this experiment, virus is spreading locally. You can get a lot from just looking at single cells. Um, for example, this is a plot of, um, of the uh, LC3 puncta and the viral yield in the first and second and third cycle of infection. What you see is that the formation of these autophagic-like membranes is cell autonomous. That is, it's happening only in the infected cells. So it's not some signal of stress that's spreading through the, the population. What happens when we induce autophagy? So this is nicardipine as an inducer of autophagy discovered by Jun Yong Yuan at Harvard. Um, that it has an effect on autophagy has been used in other things for a long time. So I think you can see the red cells coming here and here at about the same frequency to start with. Again, this is over 48 hours. And you see local spread, I th but I think you can see that it's faster. OK, this can be plotted here with two different inducers of autophagy. So here is the first, second, and third cycle of infection without autophagy stimulation. Here's the first, second, and third cycle with. So the cellular process enhances viral spread. Does it do so without lysis, as we might expect? Well, that's what we're in the business of quantifying right now. But you know, I was really having, we were having a hard time for years trying to think of like mathematical ways to show that the spread was nonlytic. And then we realized you can just look at cells now on a single cell basis and show that it's nonlytic. Like, look at this. This is a low multiplicity of infection. So here's an infected cell at eight hours post infection. This is its neighbor. It's getting infected, really infected, and this cell isn't dead. And we can confirm this by live cell staining as well. So, so there are events like this that you can see in the, in the, um, in the, in the images. And you can show, and Sarah's in the process of, of of demonstrating that that's in, in increased by um, autophagy. The sharp eye of you might have noticed something else really humorous that you can see by live cell imaging. Remember, these are, H, uh, these are HUH7 cells. They're not macrophage or anything. So I hope you can see this cell. It's infected. And look what happens to it. <laughs> <laughs> now, if that's not, not non-dispersive spread, I don't know what is. I mean, every, every virus that cell had was used to infect the other virus. And if anybody has ever seen cells eat each other that are viral infected, I would love to hear more about that. Because this is a process called entosis. It's been described in cancer by Joan Brugge, but I don't know about its happening with viruses. OK, so what I showed you was that we can suppress diversity by choosing a dominant drug target with respect to drug resistance. What I showed you is that the cellular process of autophagy can, main, can maintain local spread, possibly continue the su suppression of that diversity. Should we take nicardipine when we take a, a, a monotherapy with an antiviral? Should we not? <laughs> Should we take an inhibitor of autophagy? These are all experimental questions that can be addressed. I want to tell you just in the last few minutes about another um, host target that we found, and those among you who like classical viral susceptibility genetics will like this. This is also in honor of Laurent, because this work was done to finish um, complete work that was started in the lab of Michel Braich, who, in whose lab Laurent did his graduate work. OK, so here's a picture of Michel. After retiring from the Pasteur Institute, we were lucky enough to have him come to our lab, where he's been for about five years. And the reason I couldn't let him retire, I'm going to tell you here. OK, so this is something they worked on for many years in his lab at the pa Institut Pasteur. And this is classical susceptibility genetics. You take this mouse, it's a white mouse, and this mouse, which is a black mouse, and they have a lot of other differences as well, as you'll see. But, um, and you infect them with Tyler's virus. Now, Tyler's virus is a picornavirus related to pol like poliovirus. But when it infects um, the nervous system of mice, they have a lot of genetic differences in the way they respond to it. Some clear it, some don't. Of those that don't clear it and become persistently infected, some go on to develop chronic demyelination, like um, very similar to um, multiple sclerosis, and some don't ever develop those pathologies. So one of the things that they were interested in in Michelle's lab was crossing and crossing and crossing to find the susceptibility loci that dictated these traits, which is very interesting, time-consuming, work that I think we really need to harvest as um, molecular biologists. I mean, a lot of people did this for a long time, and they have some really interesting natural polymorphisms. OK, so here's what you see with Tyler's persistence. The black mouse clears it. The white mouse doesn't. That's viral RNA in the brain. 
you cross and you cross and you cross to get trend. Um, so here's the black genome, here's the white genome. Here are the congenics that identify this locus. This is white with intergress black. This is black with intergress white. They both confer the opposite phenotype. Now, identified this cross um, showed enough, a small enough intergress region that you could look at the, the candidate genes here. And there it was pretty interesting. It's IL-22, interferon gamma, and a long non-coding RNA. Remember, this was like a while ago, right? A long non-coding RNA discovered by virtue of this cross that's um, transcribed convergently with interferon gamma. So of course, this, so this is why Michelle couldn't retire. Because the question is, what's that long non-coding RNA doing? Is it, you know, as you know, it's now appreciated that we have like 900 long non-coding RNAs in our genome, and the function of about four of them is known. So I was excited about this. Oh, I hate it when they do that. OK, so, <laughs> but the, the problem was is that this Tyler's virus persistence phenotype takes 45 days. And you know, that, we weren't going to do that. So, um, so here are some other phenotypes that Antonio Gomez showed. I'll show you his picture a little later, and he's here too. OK, so, so this is Tyler's virus clearance. It, the presence of the RNA and the white locus causes it to go down. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, it stays, the clearance goes down, it stays in the brain. Here's salmonella infection. We were interested in that because that's a salmonella infection is something very sensitive to interferon gamma. So, and Denise Monac's lab was next door. So here are the black mice dying of um, salmonella infection. Here they are with that intergressed white locus. So it saves your life if you're infected with salmonella. It doesn't allow you to clear Tyler's virus. Here are CD8 T cells taken out in cultured ex vivo stimulated with um, PMA and ionomycin. Here are the black mice not making enough interferon gamma to shake a stick at. And here are the ones with the white chromosome intergressed. So they make, this confers inducibility to interferon gamma in CD8 T cells. And not in any other um, T cells, it, but I'm not showing you that. OK, so I just wanted to know about the non-coding RNA. I, I frankly didn't care about the other genes in the locus, <laughs> much to Michelle's chagrin. So what, Antonio and I did, who also likes RNA, was make transgenic mice in this black background. It turns out the black background didn't make much of the non-coding RNA. So if you make the transgenic um, mice from the, the black allele, that's shown in blue. Transgenic mice from the white allele are shown in yellow. And what you can see with respect to the salmonella phenotype is the non-coding RNA saves your life if you're, um, if you're a mouse and if you're infected with salmonella. And as does the yellow one, um, it turns out in other experiments, not quite as effectively, but you can see that, that the non-coding RNA has a function in defeating pathogens. Here's the other phenotype, that is um, inducibility of uh, interferon gamma in T cells. And again, you see the effect of the locus, you see the effect of this yellow non-coding RNA, and the effect of this blue non-coding RNA, which by themselves confer indu inducibility to interferon gamma synthesis upon stimulation. Um, yeah, so, so we're pretty excited about that. The classical virology identified a long non-coding RNA and a function both in immunology and in pathogen susceptibility. Interestingly, it confers kind of opposite functions. For example, this long non-coding RNA clears, um, helps you survive salmonella infection, helps the mice survive salmonella infection, but doesn't allow them to clear the virus, right? Confers inducibility of interferon gamma and doesn't allow them to clear the virus, right? Interferon gamma is supposed to help clear viruses. So we don't understand all that and why inducing in inducible interferon gamma synthesis only in CD8 T cells would seem to be anti-inflammatory. If anybody has any good ideas, the immun immunologists get crazy when you say that. So, um, but that seems to be the phenotype. And we think that that's a really neat thing about the immune system, of course, because the immune system is there to clear viruses, uh, is there to clear pathogens, but it can overreact, right? Sometimes you die of the pathogen because your immune system isn't inflammatory enough. Sometimes you die of the inflammation. So this kind of balanced mixed polymorphism is what we think is so interesting about the war between the pathogen and its host. OK, so how do you, I'm almost done, actually. Thank you for letting me, she, she said she'd stand up a minute early. OK, so this is all we know about the mechanism of this long non-coding RNA. As some of you guys know, long non-coding RNAs so far seem to recruit um, proteins in the, in the chromatin modification complex to target genes. 
Often they recruit chromatin modification proteins that are um, inhibitory, like the exist RNA that silences the Rx chromosomes. Um, this one, there's one discovered by Howard Chang at, at Stanford that recruits activating methyl transfer, transferases. Because this RNA activates the gene next to it, we thought we'd look with Howard to see if it co-IPs with this protein like his. So these are the protein and the RNAs are expressed in 293 cells and IP'd. Here, the, here the, this protein is bringing down, not bringing down U1 RNA and bringing down our nest RNAs. And also not shown is his um, hot tip RNA. So we think that this non-coding RNA interacts directly with chromatin modification enzymes. And um, in that way, it can affect pathogen susceptibility. So as a host factor, you know, that'd be interesting. You could, you could knock it out to um, help to, to make a system more inflammatory. You could stabilize it to make it less inflammatory. And so we're interested in working on that. And I think I showed um, Antonio's picture at some point. But the most important thing is the people who did the work. Elizabeth, Sarah, Antonio are all graduate students in the lab. Michelle Brahik is on an extended sabbatical. These are the other people in my lab. We're working on great projects I haven't mentioned. Here are our, our um, collaborators at various places. The people in red are people who actually did experiments, <laughs> as opposed to telling them to do experiments or trying to encourage them to do experiments. And scientifically, what I told you is that to express diversity in RNA viruses, um, you need to be in a ligomeric form. And so maybe that's why capses don't evolve as fast. But in the specific case of, of antivirals, um, we should target oligomers. That gets propagated if viral spread is local, which we can manipulate by understanding the cell biology. And we discovered classical virology taught us the function of a new non-coding RNA. I'm done. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. That was really interesting, Carla. Um, do you have any idea yet what, um, whether your new long coding RNA um, associates with any particular promoters, host promoters, presumably to modify yeah. them? Her question is that the non long non coding RNA associates with any particular promoters. That's our next experiment. That is, Howard's lab has innovated a technique that he calls CHIRP, <laughs> which is basically, I don't know the basis of this acronym, it's CHIP with the RNA in there somewhere, right? So you can IP the RNA and ask what chromatin DNA comes down with it. So that's the next step to figure out if anything besides interferon gamma is affected. Dr. Andino. <laughs> he doesn't, okay. Yes. That was a very nice talk. Thank in, you. In terms of the V073 inhibitor, you said capsids evolve slower, target all aglomeric capsids. Couldn't the virus overexpress capsid as a way of titrating out the, the poison, the competitive inhibitor, instead of evolving around it? Um, so the question is, could the virus overexpress capsid to titrate out the inhibitor? Um, or otherwise genetically evade the inhibitor, like by not oligomerizing its capsids or, or making two, or increasing the affinity maybe of the capsids. Um, again, I think that those things are theoretically possible. Um, this is an experimental problem, not a theoretical one in some ways. And like I said, I think that even an RNA genome can't explore all of sequence space in the time that it has. You know, I mean, you might be able to engineer such a thing it, it becomes experimentally testable whether or not it does in real time in a real host. But sure, you can, you can think of that. So if you did the experiment where you would produce a cell line which overexpressed capsid, only capsid infected, uh, I mean, you could test this, right? right you can measure right. basic reproductive ratios in the presence and absence of the inhibitor. Overexpressed, in yeah, overexpressed. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. He's suggesting that we could test it explicitly by overexpressing capsid protein in a cell line and seeing if the virus is still if its um, assembly is still suppressed, if its infectivity is still suppressed. It's a good idea. Dr. Kipker, it was an excellent talk and it stimulated many questions, but I have to choose one. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I think I read a paper um, the, in which um, they demonstrate there is a number of bottlenecking during infection in vivo. 
a number of what? Uh, bottlenecks. Bottlenecks, yeah. During infection. That's right. Right. So when when Julie yeah. was in your lab and 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 so how do you because you know I think all the you know cell to cell transmission and you know and the dominant effect and cell to cell transmission makes sense when there is no bottlenecks but during an infection you might encounter that kind of things and in that case you know dominance should be less effective and yet your critical experiment is in vivo you don't see resistance so how do you do you, you know, so and how okay. can we what, understand? What Raoul's referring to is something you guys all probably know about, which is that sometimes if you're infected, for, if you're infected in some tissue and then, you, and then a virus is going to spread to another tissue, sometimes, surprisingly, it's only one virus. There's some kind of bottleneck to that transfer. So if just one virus gets to go off and infect a tissue by itself, then that, it should be able to express its diversity, whatever that is, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's still a question of, of numbers, right? And, and it's also a question of the, the concentration in that tissue. So, you know, the reason, vi you know, poliovirus, for example, isn't um, neurovirulent at low doses is because there's less virus, right? In this case, there didn't seem to be that much less virus. But a lot of the virus still th there was still drug susceptible. Maybe it's stable, you know, maybe, right? So, so the... Um, I assume that the bottleneck just samples whatever particles are there. And if they're dead, they're dead. <laughs> and if they're, right, so, so I don't know. So in, in this case, bottlenecking doesn't seem to affect it that much. If you think about the bottlenecks people have observed in viral infections, they're very rarely on the step of transmission. So for example, you know, poliovirus doesn't want to to paralyze you, and it only did in the epidemics 1% of the population. It wants to be an enteric infection and to spread uh, fecal orally. So the, the place there is the least bottleneck is to the intestine. And to places like the brain, which we care about medically, it's, there's a very severe bottleneck. So answer to the, that question is I don't know. <laughs> I hope you can hear him. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a great believer in uh, uh, viral ability to escape uh, and mutate away. Uh, uh, so we presented the virus, of course, was a very difficult challenge. Uh, but um, uh, just like some other mutants, which you must, uh, which you probably know uh, about, uh, the, there can be unexpected or unpredictable ways for the virus to get away. Uh, and I'm wondering, if you simply keep the pressure, are you going to see viruses which uh, become even more? Uh, as, as we know, poliovirus likes to replicate in cysts, and the proteins like to uh, interact with their own RNA. Uh, do you think you will eventually be able to select for a virus where the capsid comes entirely from its own RNA, and so it escapes this way? It's a great question. So the question is maybe the, maybe the variant could evolve to package only in cysts. So a lot of positive strand RNA viruses make proteins that only work in cysts. And that's brilliant, of course, because if you're going to evolve and you're in some messy place, you might as well keep your protein products as close as possible and only you benefit from them, right? So, so that's what a positive strand viruses seem to do with a lot of their, their proteins. They don't seem to do it with their capsids yet. But your suggestion is that would be one way to evolve to do that, to keep the proteins a little closer. And um, probably one of the more likely ones. Uh, these are empirical questions. You know, I think we'll just keep the pressure up, like you said, and see what happens. Um, we were pretty surprised that the mouse experiment worked as well as it did, to tell you the truth. OK, thank you. Thank you.